the sea hare is um, 191 in the grim fairy tales. They all have numbers. Um, it's a, it's a, a story that I first saw in a book by David Hockney. So it sort of has a connection to a modernist tradition and he illustrated it in 1969. But uh, it's a very interesting story for me because it brings together law and the image, which is something that I'm interested in and have been interested in for a while. So in the story, there's a princess that can see everything. So obviously that connects to you know, ideas about the panopticon or that the law can see everything, that the law is some sort of big brother. But the difference in the fairy tale, which I think is really interesting, is that you can also see the princess or the, the in this case the princess isn't this sort of necessarily I think not doesn't even have to be gendered the princess represents the law so for me it's sort of like Queen Elizabeth I mean it doesn't have to be too, we don't have to go too far to move to the idea of a woman being the sovereign body so in this case there's this idea of a princess in a tower and she will marry the person that she cannot see. And so that sets up this idea in the story, for me anyway, that vision and the law are very much connected. And so that's why I was sort of drawn to it. And I was drawn to it in a way because I thought Hockney's imaging were a bit too cute and were a bit too romantic. And he didn't treat the princess seriously enough and I think something like Elizabeth the first with Kate Blanchett or our, you know our Kate in that role or even Queen Elizabeth the second it shows that a woman can be the phallus in that way or can be you know can represent the law quite seriously and in that way in even in the fairy tale um, it is a bit like Queen Elizabeth the first that's what I was thinking she's a virgin queen that won't marry because she doesn't want to give up the power so she makes this riddle that she'll only marry the person that cannot see her, but that would show that she wasn't in control of that person. And then that person becomes the outlaw or the person that's the resistor. And I found that sort of interesting because in a way that brother becomes the artist poet that resists the law. So you get this situation where the law is in control of images and the artist is in control of images and there's a sort of battle to see who's going to win. So in terms of why I approached it in terms of this sort of paper cut method, part of the story is to take fables seriously. That's the other aspect of this, that I think that fairy tales and our ideas of you know, queens and princesses and kings and princes are actually really important ways that we know the law, because otherwise the law is such a strange thing. Um, and as a painter or as an artist, you could rely on weird allegories, but I'm just not certain what sort of power they have in images. So, for example, you know, the Statue of Liberty was this big image of democracy and liberty and, you know, justice. But I'm not sure if we just think of that more as a Halloween costume that you could wear or something that's been declassed so much. So the hard thing when you're doing these images is to try and create something that you can respond to. And I think that I just sort of pared it all back. So in terms of the paper cuts, I think that fits this sort of fably, fairy taley, sort of childish, simplified idea of the law so that we can use that as a starting point to sort of go into more complex ideas. And then of course, in terms of an art background, it brings out a sort of playfulness around these issues, which I think connects to sort of Dada performance or Brechtian performance, or even sort of surrealist masks. And I think that that's something that people are playing with quite a lot. So, you know, thinking of Justine Williams quite quickly, or, um, you know, other artists in Australia, but other international artists that have dealt in that sort of manner. So you start with something simple and then see, but in this case, I ended up thinking that narrative was going to be quite important. So I have brought the paper cuts, I've tried to animate them. And one of the ideas I had was to do a paper cut animation, a bit like South Park, which I have done previously in 2008. That was the first reason why I got into paper cuts to turn them into animation. And actually I've just done a paper cut animation for Andrew Frost's um, 
A to Z of contemporary art, which is coming out soon as well. But in this case, what I did was I animated it more in that Dada fashion through just performance in the studio. I didn't create big theatrical sets, which I guess is another connection to, to um, Justine's sort of approach. Um, and I did get two actors, so I didn't get performance artists, but I did get two theatrical uh, artists, so um, Ewan Leslie and Erin Jean Norville, who both got improv backgrounds, so they were able to sort of play with the paper as props. So there were all these weird props, and we had paper suits that were made by Yuli Gerzinski as well. So he, he's a, a young fashion designer that actually deals with paper. So I thought to create this sort of paper world, I'd get these guys together. And we did have a lot of fun in the studio while we were shooting. And if we felt that there was a prop that needed, you know, you could make it quite quickly. It wasn't a hugely, uh, you know, uh, strained process. It was quite fun, quite simple. And the site of the theatre in the video is the artist's studio. In yeah, I think that the studio is animated as well. So. On one level, it is about video, theatre and narrative, but then the site of it is the studio. So I think that throws back to the static, the painting, you know, the paper cut as illustration in a storybook. And in fact, just to say, some of the criticism I got was that perhaps it didn't need to be a video, that the, this notion of the tableau vivant could have been actually just tableaus that were photographs or stills. Uh, but I think that I quite like that idea of the tableau then coming to life in a very minor way. And I think that the theatrical improvisation did bring something to it that maybe photography didn't or wouldn't. And I was looking that again at things like um, movies like Peter Greenaway or um, you know, Orlando has a lot of actual tableau vivants in it. That in the old days, the static painting would come on as a curtain and then it would reveal the actors behind that were moving. So I, I sort of feel that it has that um, sort of, it activates the paper cuts in that way. Yeah, not just through props. So one thing that I was uh, aware of was that the story does exist. And I think this happens in, that you, in contemporary art especially, you can declass things and make things more unclear, which I think that's in the end what I did with the paper cuts and the video as well, is to keep things open. Uh, knowing that you could always get the fairy tale on the internet, you know, you can always look up the sea hare, or you can always look up Hockney's illustrations of it. So I didn't want it to be a direct illustration. Um, and so I think I did want that to be sort of more fun. And we did cut things out and we did focus on certain things. I mean, I know it's a difficult issue in contemporary art, which I'm not totally worked, you know, I haven't worked out exactly where I fit on that. So something like William Kentridge doing an opera or William Kentridge, the way he approaches narrative or old stories or short stories, he always says it's his take on it or a transliteration. He's not trying to translate it or do it directly. And I'm not sure exactly what that means, where that slippage or gap is and what the importance of that is. But one of the things that I did want to pull out strongly in the piece, which I think Hockney didn't do. So one thing in the Hockney illustrations that's very much not there is this idea of the outlaw. There's a fox in the story that gives the prince or the poet the way to counter the law. And he didn't draw him at all. So I thought that my idea would be to focus very strongly on this sort of outlaw um, freedom fighter character. And I think what comes out of it, and I think what's important to me, is that the law uses images to make us into good subjects. So that's why someone, you know, like Gregory and Watts, you know, Tim Gregory and I took the uh, royal wedding very seriously. We did a sort of video based on talking about the royal wedding because we were thinking it is through a royal wedding, deep down in our psyche, that's what makes us believe in the law. So the point of the story, and I think the point of the fable, is that you can use images against the law if you want. And I actually have just seen recently with the, the Mardi Gras that there was police violence. Now the crowd put their videos against the police. And there's this, you know, that you can reverse the panoptic gaze. 
And I think that's definitely what happens in this fable because what's at stake is the princess will lose if she can't see you, if you're a blind spot. And in the, in the, the work that I did, the, the fox tells the poet, artist, philosopher how to become a blind spot, how to become the sovereign themselves so that the, the princess can't see you, how you get into the tower and become the law yourself. So that's where this romantic thing comes. At the end, they get married because the poet becomes the new prince. But another way of looking at it is there's been a total coup d'etat. She's been overthrown. But again, that's where the gender comes in. I don't want the idea that you know, the, the princess has been overthrown by a prince. It's just one legal system has been overthrown for another. In terms of the visual, it is difficult, as I was saying earlier, to, to image the law without relying on these old forms. But I, I sort of think that that's fine. So besides the notion of princes in towers, princesses, there, there's also a lot of violence in the original fable, which I think is very important to the law now, as, as you know, we can see from police brutality or wars, that the sovereign has the power to call a war. In this case, the princess, if she sees you, you die. So the fable starts, and there is in the video quite a lot of violence about the number of people that she's killed. So it already starts in the normal fable way of 97 heads on a pike which then become 98 and 99 and then the third brother tries. But the other thing is that I had to rely on allegories, things like suns, so he, like sovereign imagery like the sun, like a sun king. Like we know it from the sun king, but the popes have sun imagery. Princes in the Renaissance have a lot of sun imagery. So I used the notion of the sun as sovereign. I mean, I'm not sure how successful that is. That's something that I have to think about. I also did things about eyes, so all-seeing eyes. So there's a very famous portrait of Queen Elizabeth that has eyes and ears on her dress, which actually was used in Elizabeth I, the movie. This idea of the sovereign as seeing everything, like God sees everything. So that's the eye of the law. Um, and then we bring that into you know, the contemporary with the all-seeing eye. But even things like princes, like I, I make the joke that, uh, you know, we love that Prince Harry flies an Apache helicopter and is fighting for the good of the world in Afghanistan. It's sort of like a prince on a white steed. So these images are there. And I think that was in the, 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 the royal wedding as well, which I think... I try to do in my work, I'm not sure how successfully, but all of a sudden you are in this sort of trans-historical work. So I think my work is pre-modern, modern, so the paper cuts are very Matisse and, you know, there's Dada, but then hopefully the contemporary is, and then the postmodern is this notion of being interested in resistance in a way that I even think Hockney wasn't in 1969. Um, and so hopefully the contemporary is not to be shy of going back to these even pre-modern uh, symbols for law. I mean, it's just very difficult. I mean, when I talk about the law, it's sort of how are we subjects under the law? So there's father figures, there is your father, there is your mother, the parents, the school teacher, like them, maybe not so much the priest anymore, but that's sort of what I mean by the law. It's not just a small a very defined notion of law as legislation and stuff. And I think that that's important. How does power force us to do certain things? How does it control us? But I think, I don't know, so that's something that I'm working on is looking at Renaissance imagery for that, looking at princes, looking at myths and fables. Even these pre-modern things, I still think function.